law of my life has been never to ask for an office. Had I done so, I should feel that I was marring the plans of God. James Abram Garfield was his own kind of politician. The only preacher ever to become president, all his life he believed that a higher power was leading him onwards and that a great destiny lay in store for him. But he also struggled with painful self-doubt, much of which went back to his dirt-poor origins and the early loss of his father. I was a very pulpy boy. I was made the ridicule and sport of boys that had fathers and who enjoyed the luxuries of life. Hardly a day passed which did not make me feel my inferiority. It was religious faith, he said, that saved his life. When I could say, Our Father who art in heaven, I was in a new world. It was then that I began to look about me for a purpose and aim in life. He began preaching the gospel almost every Sunday and was ordained as a minister in the Church of the Disciples of Christ. While attending Williams College, Garfield became engaged to Lucretia Rudolph, Creek for short. On November 11, 1858, Garfield finally married Creek. He settled down to a life of teaching and scholarship, rising from professor of classics at Western Eclectic Institute to president of the small Ohio college. Then, in 1861, he joined the Union Army as a lieutenant colonel. Garfield perceived the Civil War as a holy crusade. God is the commander-in-chief of our armies, and God will take care of the grand consequences. He rose to the rank of Major General, and with the war still in progress, Garfield was elected to Congress. It was a seat he would hold for the next 17 years. Never once would he lose an election. The Republican Convention of 1880 was held inside a specially built wooden auditorium in Chicago. There, New York's powerful Senator Roscoe Conkling, who reigned as kingmaker of the party, put all his support behind Ulysses S. Grant, who after a four-year hiatus was seeking an unprecedented third term in office. Grant was opposed by two men, James Blaine of Maine and John Sherman of Ohio, who had asked Garfield to deliver his nominating speech. But as it turned out, Garfield's speech was so effective, it was he, not Sherman, who began to draw the attention of the crowds. Delegates from all quarters are openly expressing the wish that I was the Ohio candidate. On the 34th ballot of a deadlock convention, the Wisconsin delegation stunned the packed room when it announced it was shifting 16 votes to General Garfield. The announcement brought silence, then vigorous cheering. On the next ballot, a stampede commenced. Soon, 10,000 voices were chanting Garfield's name as the whole convention endorsed him as the nominee. Grant surrendered to Garfield, and as a partial concession to Senator Conkling, Chester Arthur of New York was then given the second spot on the ticket. In November, they won by a slim margin as James Garfield was elected the 20th President of the United States. Few men in our history have ever obtained the presidency by planning to obtain it. In most cases, it is got by accident. We reached the Senate at 11.30. Here I read my inaugurals slowly and fairly well, though I grew somewhat hoarse toward the close. That evening, Garfield moved into the White House with his mother, his wife, and their five children. With nearly two decades of political experience, he was well prepared for the presidency, with a thorough grasp of every aspect of government. 
But the scholar president soon became frustrated, spending too much of his time turning away office seekers. He came to call the presidency a bleak mountain. My God, what is there in this place that a man should ever want to get into it? These people would take my very brain, flesh and blood if they could. The key challenge for the new president involved a political tradition called senatorial courtesy, by which senators held de facto veto power over federal appointments within their home states. It virtually robs the president of his power of appointment and puts a dangerous power in the hands of the Senate. At the center of the controversy, once again stood the powerful Republican boss, Senator Roscoe Conkling, now demanding to control a key appointment in New York. When he refused to support Garfield's choice, the preacher president waged war, bursting Conkling's power struggle with the kind of strong leadership that hadn't been seen since the death of Lincoln. Of course I deprecate war, but if it is brought to my door, the bringer will find me at home. Less than four months into office, Garfield was gunned down in a Washington railroad station. Dropping to the floor, he gasped, My God, what is this? The shooter was a fanatic who believed he would please Conkling by elevating Chester Arthur to office. With a bullet lodged inside Garfield's body, it soon became clear that he was not in immediate danger of dying. Alexander Graham Bell was brought in to search for the elusive bullet with electrical devices. At the White House, an elaborate air conditioning system was built. Making daily purchases of ice, White House staff used 100 pounds of it each hour to keep the critically ill president cool throughout the sweltering summer as the nation awaited daily medical bulletins. Don't be disturbed by conflicting reports about my condition. It is true that I'm still weak and on my back, but I'm gaining every day and need only time and patience to bring me through. Garfield lingered on week after week. It was the longest period of presidential disability in the nation's history until Woodrow Wilson suffered a stroke four decades later. Finally, in September, two months after the shooting, he asked to be moved to the New Jersey shore. 300 men laid down a half mile of track so that a special train could transfer him right to the front door of his seaside cottage. Propped up before an open window, the weakening president gazed out on the waves. On September 19, 1881, with Crete at his side, James Abram Garfield died. One of the most interesting things about Garfield was the public reaction to his untimely death. There was an enormous uh, amount of emotion. It says something about the symbolic place the presidency had achieved, regardless of its incumbent. It does suggest that the deaths of presidents trip off something in American consciousness. It means something special for a man to have been in the chair that Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln were in. That already by the 1880s, the presidency had this emotive creating content in it. He was such a mixture of things. Preacher, scholar, soldier, politician, an introspective self-doubter, 
who could be passionately committed to causes and who had established something that had eluded Franklin Pierce, leadership on his own terms. <laughs>